These are all AIs which I'm currently forcing to play my favorite card game with me. And they're beating me. And this is a visualization of how the AI's brain works. It's calculating what cards to play using an algorithm called ISMCTS, Information Set Monte Carlo Tree Search. Each circle you see represents something that could happen in the game, while the lines represent the moves that make it happen. Before we get into the details though, let me give a bit of background. To figure out how we got here, we need to go back to... In the summer of 2020, my newest obsession became this card game that I remember playing in my childhood called Call Ace Whist. It's a 4 player trick taking card game, which is played on teams of 2. The catch is, the teams change every round, which provides a lot of depth and strategy. Our story begins when I was supposed to hang out with 3 of my friends in a digital, socially distanced environment. I had suggested we try playing Call Ace Whist, which they agreed to, maybe to appease me. Well, like any well-adjusted person, I got really excited. So excited, I couldn't think about anything else for that entire day. But when the evening finally came... I was shocked. I was about to suggest we find someone else to play with us, but... I was heartbroken. Not only because we weren't going to play Call Ace West after all, but also because I started to realize that, all this time, I hadn't been that excited about hanging out and having a good time with my friends. I was only thinking about this stupid game, and that was the thing I was sad about. So, anyways, let's create an AI to play with instead. <laughs> Okay, before we get into how to create an AI, let me give a brief overview of the game. You play with a standard deck of 52 playing cards plus 3 jokers. Each player gets 13 cards. During play, the first player plays a card, and the other players must play a card of the same suit if possible. The player who played the highest rank of that original suit wins that round, which is called taking a trick, and they then get to lead the next trick. There is, however, what is called a trump suit, which when played always wins over the original suit. As I said earlier, Call Ace Whist is played in teams of two, so you're actually trying to win as many tricks as possible together with another player without knowing each other's cards. The real strategy happens in the beginning of the game, however, when players bid on how many tricks they think they can take, knowing that if they win the bid, they get to choose the trump suit and also choose their partner, who will be the player with the specific ace they call to. Oh, I get it now. How do we get a computer to play this game? I mean, first of all, we have to teach the rules to the computer, but that's not enough to be good at the game. It also needs to know strategy, a way of connecting the dots to make it from the beginning of the game to a victory. I have a strategy, probably, but it's difficult to formalize it and generalize it in a way that the computer can use. So uh, let's look at another game instead, maybe that's a bit easier. Say you have a two-player game with just one pawn, but the players take turns choosing which direction it should go. As player 1, you want the pawn to land on as high a score as possible, but player 2 always makes the last move, and they want as low a score as possible. The one time in my life I've taught a class, I got the students to play this game, and they very quickly intuited that if you're down here as player 1, you shouldn't go over here, because even though player 2 can choose a 94, they'll always choose a 12. So let's merge them like this to illustrate that if you go here, it's a guaranteed 12. And the same for these. Now we can easily see that going down is the best choice for player 1. But now we can do this one step up. Player 2 knows that going down here will always result in 21, but what about these? We use the same idea, and that makes it clear that going down for the 21 is the best choice for player 2. If we keep doing this, we can see that player 1 can force a score of 53 every time, and that's the optimal play. So that's boring now. But we did just stumble upon the algorithm called Minimax. As player 1, you maximize the minimum score player 2 can choose, and vice versa. 
This game is actually just another way to represent a tree graph. Here's the same game, but in a more traditional way of visualizing it. Now, if we can convert other games to look like this tree graph, we should be able to apply the same minimax algorithm to figure out the best move. For example, tic-tac-toe can be converted into a tree graph. Every node represents a board position, and each of its branches represents a move that can be made. The connecting node will be the new position of the board. At the end of a branch, when no more moves can be made, we have a number representing the score. 1 if x wins, minus 1 if o wins, and 0 if it's a draw. This means that the x player can be called a maximizer, while the o player can be called a minimizer. They each want to maximize or minimize the score respectively. Once this tree has been completely filled out, if we were to apply the same minimax algorithm from before, we could once and for all figure out the optimal strategy for tic-tac-toe. Oh, never mind, it always ends in a draw. Let's see if we can do it for a more complex game, one that doesn't always end in a draw, despite what the world championship would have you believe. Chess. Okay, we didn't even reach the end of a single game there. Uh, you see, chess isn't a solved game like tic-tac-toe, because there are simply too many branches on the full game tree to possibly expand it fully. I did the math, and if we believe this random stack exchange post about the number of possible chess positions, and my simulation generating around 2700 positions per minute, it would take me like all day to generate them. But then, how can we apply minimax? In the examples from before, we could figure out which move the first player should make by looking at the end result of every possible branch and then collapsing them upwards using minimax. In other words, we could rely on the end result of each game to figure out if a move is good or not. But for a game as complex as chess, we can't. The solution to this is what's called an evaluation function. Before, we didn't care about what the contents of each node was, only what result we could get from it in the end. But with an evaluation function, instead of basing the value of a move on whether or not it eventually results in a win or a loss, we create a function which can look at the state of a game, a single node, and try to estimate if it's a good position or not using so-called domain knowledge of the game. For example, if you play chess, you can probably tell me which side you'd rather play in this position. Or this position. Don't get me wrong though, Writing an evaluation function isn't easy. In fact, it's a very difficult problem, even for a game with as much literature as chess. The idea is, we try our best to get the computer to quantize how good or bad a position is by putting a number on it. Then, instead of expanding the entire game tree, we just pretend that the game ends after a few moves and use the evaluation function as the score. And now we can apply minimax just like we did before, looking at which move each player would obviously prefer and deducing the best move from there. To clarify, this is all still part of what we normally call minimax, and I'm simplifying a bit, there are a bunch of other tricks used to improve this algorithm. But we'll skip all that, because now it's time to talk about... Evaluation functions are great and all, but can you tell me who's winning, and by how much, in this position? Or this position? What about this one? For some games, it's just not practical to write an evaluation function. Maybe you don't know anything about the game, or there isn't any established strategy for the game for you to lean on? Here's where we can use Monte Carlo Tree Search, or MCTS for short. The idea is, in the roughest sense possible, that in order to figure out if a position is good or not, you know, like our evaluation function in chess, we just make each player move randomly, over and over, until the game ends and one of them wins. Then we do that again and again, hundreds or thousands of times. While playing randomly might not be a good strategy, the idea is that all of that noise cancels out by the end. If one player wins much more often than the other when they both just play randomly, maybe it's because the starting position was better for that player? Another key change is that, instead of building the entire tree and then moving upwards, we run iterations and expand on our tree downwards as we go. Each iteration has four phases, selection, expansion, simulation, and backpropagation. In the selection phase, we keep going down our existing tree until we reach a leaf node, that is, a position which hasn't yet been expanded on. The way we select which way to go is a combination of which nodes have performed well previously, which is called exploitation, as well as nodes that haven't been explored very much, which is called exploration. 
By the way, I'm gonna use tic-tac-toe for this part as well, because I can't be bothered to program any more games for this visualization. Let's pretend that tic-tac-toe isn't a solved game, and that writing an evaluation function would be really hard, so that we would want to use MCTS. In the expansion phase, we play a random move and add the new state as a node to our tree. In the simulation phase, we then take that node and play random moves on it until the game is over. Finally, in the backpropagation phase, we go back through each node that got us here and update its average score and also keep track of how many times each node has been selected. Importantly, the node's average score is updated from the perspective of the player who made the last move on that node. So if X wins, nodes where O moved gets their average score lowered. That way, in the selection phase, on nodes where X has to move, we choose nodes that are good for X, but when O has to move, we choose nodes that are good for O. Like in Minimax, we assume that players choose the best move for themselves. We do these four phases over and over as many times as we can, until the player gets tired of waiting and we have to wrap it up. At that point, we simply play the move that has been selected the most times. The crazy part is, this works really really well, even with very basic implementations. And mathematically speaking, if you let Monte Carlo Tree Search run forever, it converges to be exactly the same as the full Minimax algorithm we explored in the beginning. So we get to approximate it without needing an evaluation function, and as a bonus, we can cut it off whenever we want to and get its current best move, unlike Minimax which has to build the whole game tree in order to be useful. Hang on, do you feel like we forgot something? Okay, it's time we address the elephant in the room. In card games, you don't know which cards the other players have, but so far, all the algorithms we looked at sort of required knowing all the information, so we could accurately predict the possible moves of the other players. I mean, of course the computer does know which cards everyone have, but if it were to use that information, that would be cheating. So we need to be able to figure out which move to make without factoring the actual cards of the opponents into the algorithm. To solve this, we need to look to this paper, and two more letters for our acronym, ISMCTS, Information Set Monte Carlo Tree Search. Now, if I'm reading this correctly, information set refers to the fact that not all information within the game are in the same set. I know my cards, but not your cards. And just because you saw me play the Queen of Diamonds, that doesn't tell you exactly what other cards I could have played. What information set MCTS does differently is that it adds an extra phase to the beginning of every iteration, determinize. Basically, at any point, the player whose turn it is to move knows some information for certain, their own cards. But they also know how many cards the other players have, and which cards have not been seen yet. So in the determinize phase, we simply distribute those cards randomly, and assume this is the real configuration of cards each player has. And now we have a state with perfect information. And now, why would that work? Well, in each iteration, this random distribution of the cards changes, which has a similar effect to the random simulation in the third phase. Over time, all the noise cancels out, leaving you with the moves that can perform the best, no matter which cards the opponents are holding. There's just one last tweak we need to make. Right now, the player's own cards are always the same. While this does seem reasonable, why wouldn't we want to work off the most accurate model? It also means that, in our simulation, the opponents all play as if they knew our cards, leaving no room for the AI to bluff or account for which knowledge the opponents actually have. To fix this, we start out by shuffling our own cards among the other players, for the first, say, 30% of the allotted time. This allows the opponent's nodes in our game tree to be built more accurately with the knowledge they should have, and only then do we start using the true information of our own cards to figure out which of our actual moves might be good. Okay, you got all that? Let me just give a quick recap. In order to create an artificial intelligence which can play my favorite card game Call a Swist, we first need to turn the game into a game tree, which represents all the moves each player can make and how the game state changes with each move, where each player receives a score at the end of the game based on if they won or lost. And it turns out when we do this, you can predict ahead of time which move a rational actor is going to make at the end of the game, and then use that knowledge to know which move the previous player should make, which you can keep doing until you reach the beginning of the game, at which point you know the best move for the first player. 
But not all games are so simple as to allow for this naive implementation of the minimax algorithm, so we need to employ evaluation functions which estimate the value of a position based on advanced knowledge of the game and the strategies that work well within it. And once we have such an evaluation function, we can make do with only building a game tree a few layers deep and try to estimate if you would win or lose in that position, which is great. But what do you do when you don't know the strategy of the game, or there's no established literature on it, or you simply aren't a skilled enough programmer to make a proper evaluation function that works? Well, in that case, you can use Monte Carlo Tree Search to iteratively build your game tree by following the four steps of selection, expansion, simulation, and backpropagation, where you start out by either exploring or exploiting child nodes, growth, expanding it with a random move, and then evaluating that position simply by playing random moves, which apparently is just as good as having a strategy, and then backpropagating that information throughout the tree and finally, if there's any kind of hidden information element to the game, which means you can't know ahead of time which moves the other players can make, you can simply start by making a blind guess about the true state of the game, and over time, all that noise generated by the randomness will cancel out to give you a pretty good answer for what the best move is. And we call that algorithm Information Set Monte Carlo Tree Search. I'm first to act here, and I have an okay hand. I have a couple of spades over here which would make a good trump suit and I have a single joker and high clubs as well. I think I'll start out by bidding 9. Natsu passes. Let's see what Rebecca has to say. She passes as well. Now Peter thinks he can do 11. Uh, keep in mind that I have three of the aces, um, so he's most likely going to call to me as the partner. I'll try passing and we'll see what happens. So the trump suit is spades, which is really, really good for me, and the partner is the ace of clubs, which is also me. Now Peter gets to exchange because he won the bid, so uh, he can exchange three cards for the ones over here. But this is looking promising considering I have a really good hand. And hopefully Peter has good cards as well. Now I don't know who has the king of spades, so I'm gonna have to play the ace of spades here. Keep in mind that because the bid is 11, Peter and I ha have to take 11 tricks, which means if Rebecca and Natsu get three tricks between them, we lose. Uh, now that I have uh, won the trick, I'll play my joker just to get that out of the way. The one disadvantage to playing the joker so early can be that it offers Natsu and Rebecca an opportunity to get rid of cards and going void in one of the suits. And if they do that, that means they can start trumping one of some of our cards. But I'll play the ace of clubs here. And hopefully Rebecca isn't able to trump it. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll see if we can repeat that and play the King of Clubs. Okay, this is perfect. Uh, let's go for the Ace of Diamonds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I like to see. Now, this won't last forever though, and I think after this, I'll play the two of spades. And hopefully Peter has at least some good spades, like the king of spades, since he chose that at, as the trump suit, right? Yep, that's perfect. And now I know that the queen and jack of spades are the highest uh, spades. Of course, Peter plays the Joker now that he finally won a trick. And this is where it starts getting dangerous. Again, now we have, what, eight tricks between us? So we have to win three more. Now there's the Queen of Clubs. I don't know if I believe that Natsu and Rebecca both have clubs left and that they won't be able to trump this. So I'm going to have to just take it. Okay, they were both forced to play clubs there. Um, I'll take this one as well.
Okay, now this is dangerous. Natsu and Rebecca are both void in trumps. Oh, and she has to start playing her jokers now because she never got to uh, lead the trick. Uh, but just like that, we did it. I think we got all 11 tricks. And Rebecca finally gets one trick, but that's fine. Yep, and just like that, Peter and I got 16 points. Thank you so much for watching this far, I really appreciate it. I hope that any of this made sense to you, and if you'd like to play the game yourself, I'll make sure to put a link in the description. See you next time.